Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. So how do you know that you're growing? You know, sometimes you can be growing and not even, it can't tell. You can't tell that you're growing, but you really are. Sometimes you're not growing and you think you are. So there are some things that you need to really focus on. And we're going to talk about that today on Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton. That's Mark Clifton sitting over there in the Hawaiian shirt. Howdy, howdy. And uh, I'm Dan Hurst. And right there is Mark Halleck. Hey, guys. And love you guys. Just love Alec. you. We're delighted to uh, to bring this up, and we hope that you can instruct us on this today, Alec, um, because there are some metrics that you have to kind of look at mm-hmm. when you're growing a church, yeah. and 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 it's kind of the the scorecard, if you will. So let's kind of kind of fill us in. What are some of those things yeah, yeah, that you yeah. can talk about? Yeah, I think we've got how many? We, we, seven we things. I think seventeen. Actually. Seventeen things. We got okay. twenty minutes to do okay. seventeen things. All right, so here ready? we go. Let's we're start. Gonna, we're only going to get seven. <laughs> <in>. <laughs> Well, one is new Christians, new Christians. And and here's what I would say. I think we're going to get this a little bit. Worship attendance can be an indicator for it's, sure. It, it's not the main indicator. Exactly. And the church growth movement had a lot of good mm-hmm. in it. Now, people don't know about the church growth movement. It, Peter Wagner and Fuller Seminary. And basically, it started, it started in the Philippines, and it was mm-hmm. a really mm-hmm. good movement mm-hmm. of God. But like a lot of great movements of God, when it comes to the United States, it becomes a consumer thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. it, it, it actually becomes a marketplace yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, right. And people start doing books and conferences and making money. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 it has de- it deteriorated into some carnality about the church growth mm-hmm. movement, which was this. It created winners and losers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And winners were those whose churches were numerically growing, yeah. regardless of what that was like, yeah. regardless of where those numbers came yeah, from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And losers were those whose churches were declining. Mm. Without thinking that you can grow numerically simply by attracting yeah. a bunch of members from other churches. Yep. And you can decline numerically because you're preaching the gospel and you're exhibiting church discipline. Yes. But the church growth movement had no room for that. Mm. And so there was if you were at the if you were the few churches that were growing, you could sit at the cool kids table at lunch. Yeah. yeah. But if you were like the rest of us, well, you could just look at the cool kids table and wonder how I could mm-hmm. get there. Mm-hmm. And so what we're pushing against today is saying, what's a me- what are the metrics of revitalization? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And attendance is one of those, but it's not even the primary one. Yeah. So here are some primary ones, and this is yeah, a good yeah. one, Mark. New Christians. Actually seeing people come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And what I would say is in a replanting context, we're not saying that you're seeing somebody get saved every week. You know, or there's a certain number. What we're looking for, I think, by God's grace, and only the Lord can save and change hearts, but are we seeing true conversions happening? Are we seeing people who are far from Christ coming to faith? Are we seeing the baptistry filled up again, right? Like one of the joys I, I remember early on is when the first baptism we had was a guy named Daniel who had been in prison and, long story short, came to know Jesus and I remember uh, our, our faithful deacon, Dave Elliott, who'd been there for 50, 60 years, just in tears going, you know how long it's been mm. since that baptistry was filled? Yeah. And I remember, you know, this is why we exist. And it sparked f- excitement in our people to go, you're right. There are people who need Jesus. There are people who need Jesus. So I would say a true indicator is, are people coming to Christ? Now, again, you can go through times where we haven't seen somebody come to Jesus in a long time. But that's what we pray for. That's what we preach for. And that's why we equip our people to hopefully love on the lost and, and live on mission and, and, and expect God to save people. I'm just going to be very frank about this. We live in a lost culture and a lost world, and there are unsaved people all around us. And God is doing some amazing things in converting people in some of the most oppressive mm. cultures in, in the world right now. In, in communist cultures, like in China, in, uh, in, in Muslim cultures where it's under penalty of death, mm-hmm. and yet the church is growing. Mm-hmm. So don't tell me, yeah, well, right. you know, our neighborhood's resistant to the gospel. The whole world's resistant yes, to the gospel. That's right, that's but right. the gospel is greater than anything. That's right. And I, I'm, I agree with you. I'm not saying that you got somebody coming down the aisle every week, mm-hmm. but I don't think you can say our church is really in a revitalized mode if we're not seeing a stirring of evangelism yes. and an attraction of the gospel on people who don't know Jesus. And listen, he did say, if I be lifted up, mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I will draw men mm-hmm. unto me. That's right. And that's not just the yeah. pastor's responsibility. No. That's right. So, it's I mean, people. Your, your people have to have to become evangelistic, too. It's, and the, the contrary to that is you got churches that can grow numerically and never baptize anybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. the church down the street mm-hmm. split. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I see. I grew up Southern Baptist, dude. I see this all the time. <laughs> you you have a church that grew from fifty to eighty, mm-hmm. or fifty to one hundred and eighty. I'm sorry, yep. in in two years. You go, wow, that's great. There's a backstory there. Oftentimes, the backstory is a church two miles away got mad at their pastor and split, and a hundred people left and ended up over at that church. Yeah, yes. you know what I'm yep. talking about, yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. 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 We we could point to churches in Kansas City, absolutely, and then they go, oh man, they really are growing. No, yep. they just took a bunch of disgruntled members, or maybe they weren't disgruntled. Maybe they left for the right reasons. I, yep. I'm not yep. going to judge yep. it, but they they moved to another church. And what we're saying is, true revitalization is when the gospel begins to become. Uh, impactful in the lives of people who don't know Jesus. Amen. Yeah. That's and that's right. what you that's want. Right. That's right. Look, I'm going to be honest with you. I love the praise of men. Okay, I struggle mm-hmm. with that every day mm-hmm. of my life. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, if I'm pastoring a church of 50 and then all these people start joining from another church and, you know, you know, we got 150, I'm going to feel pretty good about that. Yeah. But what I really want to feel good about is if I have my church of 50 and sometime in that year there's a there's a young family in our mm-hmm. neighborhood that comes to know Christ yes. and we get to baptize mom Amen. and dad. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be honest with you. That should that should motivate us more than getting a hundred already baptized yeah. people to come and be part yeah. of our church. So, well, and this leads, okay, so new Christians, number one. Here's number two that I think is really, is people are growing as disciples. Mm-hmm. They're maturing in their faith. They, and that's being expressed in a in a growing hunger for God, a love for the Lord, a delight in his word, and a love for people. Discipleship. I can remember... Maybe you remember this. Years ago, Willow Creek, which was one of the largest churches, I think at one point, the largest church in North America. Yep. And they did a study about 20 years in, and I can't remember the name of it, but basically what they realized is we have, we've reached tons of people. I mean, mm-hmm. thousands upon thousands of people. We've seen thousands of people baptized, but we have failed to make disciples. Mm. We have failed to see these folks fully committed to Jesus Christ. And uh, it, it adequately, I think, to their credit, radically shifted their approach to ministry. But I mention this because the truth is we're called to make disciples, yep. not just converts. I mean, con- converts is where it starts. We want people to give their life to Jesus. But when I see churches where people are being discipled, where uh, Christian education is taken seriously, um, you're seeing a church where the Spirit is moving, and it's a mark of revitalization. What would you say to that? I would think that you want to see your people becoming more like Jesus and loving Jesus and loving each other more year after year. If your church is not loving the Scripture, if you're, if, put it this way, if you don't see a, among your people, not all of your people, but if you don't see a general movement among among the church family of loving the Scripture more, loving each other more, yes, yes. and loving the world more, yeah. then you've got a problem. And, and rather than focus on, you know, man, we've got 50, we want to grow to 60, take the 50 you've got, mm-hmm. and are they, are they behaving more like Jesus this mm-hmm. year than they mm-hmm. did last year? Mm-hmm. Are husbands loving their wives more than they did before? Mm-hmm. Uh, are, are people loving their neighbors? Are people loving their, the people who don't love them? Are people loving each other in the church? Yeah. Is, is, is dissension going down? Yeah. Are we unified? Yeah. Are we growing more like Christ? Yeah. Love is the marker. Love, love for is God the marker. love for people. So the first revitalization marker is, is the gospel being presented and yep. our lives being changed in the community. Yep. I'm going to tell you, I, I, I believe that if you can go year after year after year and not see anybody baptized, mm-hmm. you've got to really question whether that church is in a revitalization stage, even if it's growing numerically. Mm-hmm. Secondly, if you have people who are still cold and indifferent and don't really care about God's word and criticize each other and you've got to constantly be in referee and fights between mm-hmm, everybody. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you're growing numerically, you're mm-hmm. not being revitalized. Mm-hmm. All right. Yep. What's All right. number th- what's a third one? What's a third one? Total giving <laughs> more than weekly per capita giving. In other words, you know, what we look at is the weekly per capita giving, we look at that in growth sometimes and say, you know, well, we got this many people giving this much money and everything. But I want you to look at how people are being generous with everything yeah, in their life. Yeah, that's good. All right? Yep. Sometimes people, they give, you know, to the church out of obligation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's some people who just check things off lists. Some mm-hmm. people are, are very legalistic. And that's not bad. Mm-hmm, I don't mean that. Mm-hmm. But I, rather than looking at just per capita giving – 
look at your people's lives mm-hmm. and see how generous they are yeah, with their money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are they good. willing to help people they don't even know? Are they yeah. willing to give to somebody if it's not a tax write-off? Yeah. yeah are they willing yeah. to help somebody with that needs some gas money or somebody yeah. in their neighborhood that needs some food? Do you see a sense of generosity arising yeah. in them? So many times we just look at per capita giving and we kind of like we're in a business. Hey, per capita giving's up. Well, that may be good. Or per capita giving's down. That may be good. But in per capita giving, you got people who, who maybe their job has ceased and they can't give anymore. So look more generally at mm. are they generous? Yeah. And, you know, one of my favorite really phrases good. is this. You do not have to be wealthy to be generous. You just have to be generous to mm. be generous. Yeah. Mm. All right. And when Jesus wanted to point out the most generous person in all of the Bible, he chose the poorest person, yeah. the widow's mite. That's oh, right. Yeah. That's right. So, I had that's a fr- right. friend down in, when we were down in uh, to Question, Florida, and uh, one of the guys in our church was a teacher at the Christian school. And, uh, of course, you, you know, teachers in Christian schools don't yeah. make very much yeah. money, especially in this particular school, especially in this particular era. And so, but you know what? This guy had the gift of giving. Mm. And it wasn't money, but I guarantee you, if you needed a set of tires, oh, I got a set of tires mm. in my garage. I'd be glad to give wow. you. Where'd you get them? I don't, I, you know, <laughs> saw them at a garage sale and picked them up for five bucks, you know. And and he, I, I mean, he would give stuff. He was, he had that heart. He wanted to give to mm-hmm. bless. Mm-hmm. And and anything, you, we have a saying in, 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 in our church that, a blessing is what causes someone to praise God. That's how you know it's a yep. blessing. Yep. I bless you. That means I do something that causes mm, you to praise I God. Like that. I bless somebody. I do something that causes them to praise God. And so giving is a way of causing somebody yes. to praise God. Yeah. And if they have that mentality. Okay. I'm going to go, go, go way off the range here. All right. So Dan and I, we go way back, like we've said before, for all of our lives. And we were actually uh, planting a church together in uh, Blue Springs, Missouri early 1980s, all right? And um, we had a couple of elderly ladies in that church. Elder, they're probably our age. They're probably, <laughs> what, <laughs> they're probably what we are right now. <laughs> no, no, they had to be older. No, they, I feel like they're 100. They're probably 60 <laughs> like we are. They seemed elderly at the time. A couple of elderly ladies. I won't name their names because their kids are still around. And I don't want to do that. But they were always competing with each other for, our, for the attention of, of yeah. young Dan and me. And so one of them <laughs> just noticed one time, talking about generosity, that my shoes were looking pretty bad. <laughs> and, uh, and so they asked me my shoe size and and uh, so they bought me this new pair of shoes. Oh, and they I remember were beautiful, this. Yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And I the other one <laughs> got real jealous that she bought Dan a new pair of shoes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> and we started, so Dan and I started this competition. Of, you know, we get a whole wardrobe out of these two ladies. If we, <laughs> there's more to the story there than that. But the generosity yeah, that yeah, I yeah. felt from yeah. that lady, even though they were competing with each other, yeah, 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 yeah. the generosity I felt with them. Well, that's not the generosity I'm talking no, about. No, it's okay. not. <laughs> I'm talking about the <laughs> okay, I'm going to move us on. That's good. That's a great story, brother. I'd like to hear more about that. So just by way of review real quick. So we're, so marks of, of revitalization, a score guard metric. New believers, people are coming to faith in Jesus. Secondly, people are growing as disciples, their love for God and people. Thirdly, generosity, right? Radical yeah. generosity. The fourth one here I think is really important, and I'm going to bring these two together. Are we seeing first-time guests and second-time guests? Let's talk about that. Yeah, let me talk about that. So first-time guests... When, are we seeing new people actually show up on Sunday morning mm-hmm. or to another event, but it's going to typically be Sunday morning? If we're not, that's an indicator that probably uh, myself, our congregation, we're not getting it in terms of the importance of invitation. We, we talk a lot about becoming an invitational culture. Everything we do in the church, we want to invite those who are far from Jesus to come because we want them to experience the love and the joy of the Lord in his people. And so first-time guests, are we seeing first-time guests? Like regularly, mm-hmm. weekly, I would say. I, well, one of the things I say to our church is, it should be weird if a week goes by and you haven't invited somebody to church. That's yeah. right. It should be strange. That yeah. should be, because it, 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 it shouldn't be weird to invite somebody to church. So first-time guests. But then a follow-up is, are we seeing second-time guests? Right. And that has more to do with, if first-time guests is more invitational, Second time guest has to do with how do they feel once they enter the building? Well, one of the things that we do is we found in our church that it was difficult. Um, people would invite people, 
I mean, and it's really, hey, well, you ought to come to church with me sometime. Yeah. Well, okay, yeah, sometime we'll yeah. go to church. But we 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 gave them tools. We had yeah. made a little brochure, yeah. you know, that was really well done. And they could they could either just hand it to them, or they could write a note on it and mail it to them. There are all different ways that they could mm. use it. But that became that became a tool that they could use. Yes. Hey, yep. this is this is my church. This is where I go. I'd love I for love you to that. come in. And so they okay, well they come, and then we would tell them as visitors. First of all, we don't introduce visitors. You know, yeah. and, you know, you don't just, hold on, hold on, don't do that. Oh, oh, hold on, you, oh, please, whatever oh, you do, oh. don't introduce <laughs> visitors. When I was a kid, I still can't believe, do you think, does that still happened. go on a lot? It, no, but up until the <laughs> 1980s, my, the ushers would be so excited. They stand at the back with these cards that had red ribbons that said visitor. Oh, and my no. dad would say, do we have any first-time guests with us today? Please stand. Yeah. And the ushers would hand them the card and yeah. the, red, yeah. the red deal. No way. Now, there was a time. you got to know there's a reason for everything, all right? Oh, it's painful. There was a time near the end of the, 20, near the, end of the 19th century, yeah. early 20th century, when – if you did not acknowledge a visitor, you were rude. Mm, okay. And so you okay. would say, we're glad to have someone. We don't know who you are. Please, tell us who you are. Stand. Yeah. Yeah. If you we're didn't glad do you're that, here. Yeah. If you didn't do that, you were rude. Yeah. That was just a rural kind of thing, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Because people didn't travel much. Yeah. <coughs> and so if you had somebody new there, you had to, oh, we're so glad you're here. Who are you? That carried over into the middle of 20th century to sort of, hey, yeah. we want to acknowledge you. So then we had the thing where it says, I'll tell you what. If you're here for the first time, you remain seated and everybody else stand. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what. The view is not good when that happens. So, yeah. Anyway, just don't. don't, well, yeah, yeah, don't yeah, yeah. But what we yeah, do yeah, yeah, is, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. we will not introduce. And we tell them, you know, yeah. we're not going to introduce you. We know, we're not going inter- to inter- embarrass you in any way, shape, or form. But, uh, you know, if you come back, if you choose to come back, you know, I'd like to meet you. Uh, and, and because we consider people who come back the second time. Now, I always meet them first time. Sure. You know, but if we if you're coming back a second time, we don't consider you a visitor anymore. Mm. We consider you a participant. Mm. And mm. so we call them. I yeah, use yeah, that term. Yeah. You are a participant, yeah, yeah. and we want we want you. You know, you're not a church member, yeah. but you are a participant, yeah. and we want you to participate in what what's going That's on here. That's great. And so well, we I'm, involve them that way. I love that. I I think if you're seeing a lot of first time guests and not second time guests, what's probably going on there that they'll never tell you is they didn't feel cared for. Mm-hmm. They didn't feel comfortable. They didn't feel wanted. They felt like. It felt strange to them. Their kids weren't cared for, whatever it might be. Or intimidated. Be. Or intimidated. And so okay. second-time guests is a, is a definite sign that there's health here. We're caring about those who the Lord is bringing into our midst. And so it's really, really important. And, so, and, and let me ask you yeah. something. How many guests do you see, like in your church, first-time guests, that come on their own and not because somebody invited them? Uh, hardly any. Right. I mean, and we, and that's the first question I ask. How did you hear about us? Mm-hmm. And nine out of ten times, it's we were invited, or yeah. we know this family. These folks told us whatever. Some will get us, you know, they move to Denver and they check out the website or whatever. But very few. It's yeah. invitational. It's always it's a always relational. Always invitational. That's always right. Always relational. And that's where we've got to train our people to be uh, invitational, to invite their friends, to invite people in their community. Okay, so we need to talk briefly about. Uh, what to do with first-time guests. It's a balance between making them feel welcome and not making them feel conspicuous. Yeah, good, good. So generally what I would do is I would say, you can learn about us from our website and or our whatever. It's on. It's printed in the bulletin. My phone number is in the bulletin. You can text us even during the worship service. If you have any questions, feel free to text us. We'll get back to you. If you'd like to know more about us, we'd like to know about you. But then I normally would say when I was at Warnell, but if you would like to, you don't have to fill out anything. We're just glad you're here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People now want to be able to be, meet you at their own pace. Yeah. So yeah. you have to walk that line between not ignoring them but yeah. not making them feel jumped upon. Either. We need to do a whole podcast on that. Okay. Not today, and, but... No, and, and and we always had greeting. We always had bags at the back, and we'd oh, have yeah. some, you know, some cookies or some things in it. Yeah. Maybe a, a mug with not our church name. That's who cares about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, oh man, I got in trouble there. A bunch <laughs> of people have church <laughs> mugs, you know. But it's a nice mug. Maybe with some uh, a, a, a gift card for coffee or something mm-hmm. like that, and, and and information about our church. Maybe a a, a booklet about the gospel or something, yep. and give yep. those to people. But, you know, and we live in a time, you know, how do you follow up? Again, you follow up almost to the degree you feel like they want you to follow up. Mm-hmm. Oh, let's do a whole podcast on Yeah, yeah, okay. We, let's we gotta, just bust through these final on. three. Okay. 
So the fifth one is community ministry involvement. Give us 30 seconds on that. If, 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 if your church is not part of the fabric of the community, you're not being revitalized. Let me just put it that way. Yep. In other words, if your church closed and your community didn't even notice it, you're not being revitalized. Mm-hmm. Your church needs to be important in that community, even to the people who don't go there. You say, how is that possible? We talked in the previous podcast about how your building can be used. Are you working with the schools? Are you caring for people? Mm-hmm. The, the, is the community noticeably better because your church is there? And that doesn't take a growth in attendance to do that. So that's that's that one. That's really good. Right. Number six, then, is worship attendance. And that's just, that's pretty obvious. Listen, we, we want to see people invited. We want to see the Lord glorified. We want to see the preaching of the word. God will grow his church. He grows his church through the preaching of his word. I believe that. Through the oh, preaching, yeah. through the prayer of God's people, through loving the community. And so worship attendance is definitely a marker. Listen, if you're going the other way, yeah. that's the whole reason why well, we're let, talking revitalization in the first place. Right, but let's talk about worship attendance real quick. Unfortunately or fortunately, it just is what it is. People consider themselves regular in attendance if they attend according to Rainer. And by the way, most mm-hmm. of these metrics came uh, through a conversation that Rainer and I had previously. So, But but according to Rainer and, and Church Answers, if they if they consider themselves regular in attendance, if they come like 1.4 mm-hmm. times a month, even less than twice a month. Yeah. So here's what you need to do in worship attendance these days. And we'll do a whole other podcast on, on the reason for these things. I'm not giving into it, but I'm just telling you what it is. Uh, count every individual person who comes throughout the month. All right? So when, you know, we did this a couple times at Warnell, and, and we take one month like October, and we would sort of register everybody who came in the month of October rather than worrying about how many we had each Sunday. And that way we could tell how many different individuals came in the month of October. Mm -hmm. And while we might only have 50 on a particular Sunday, we found out we got 90 coming that month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that rearranges how we have to do ministry. So that also, and by the way, if you do that and you don't have more coming, if you do, if you don't, if if you do that monthly count and you only got 50 on Sunday and about 50 individuals, yeah. you got a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got nobody visiting, you got nobody else coming. That's really good. That that leads us to the seventh. The final one is prayer involvement. Prayer involvement. And and boy, yeah. that's so important. Listen, it, in fact, in many ways, this is where it should start. It really should. It starts on our knees seeking the Lord, because only the Lord can bring new life to this church. And so, do you have a praying people? And it might be, I think this was true at yeah. Calvary. We had folks who wanted to be. They wanted to, to grow in prayer, but they needed to be led in that direction yeah. and invited into that. And that's where our hearts begin to break for the community. Yeah. It's through prayer. It's where we begin to care for those who are far from Jesus right. and, and begin to see our building as a tool for ministry. And if people arrive at your church, and even though it's a small congregation and maybe even declining in number, but man, they believe in prayer mm-hmm. and they pray for each other and they pray with expectancy, yep. that's going to be a revitalized church. That's right. On the other hand, you may be growing numerically by disgruntled people who show up and nobody prays. That's mm-hmm. not going to be a revitalized no, church. No, no. So we'll put these in the show notes, just some different metrics to look at as you seek to be revitalizing your church through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we've been looking at ways that you can discern if your church actually is growing. By the same token, the flip side of that is perhaps you can determine that your church isn't growing uh, because these things aren't happening. So we want to, uh, to, to remind you that not all of these have uh, firm and fast, you know, there, there, there are always exceptions to the rule, aren't there? But by and large, overall, these are, these are key things that you need to think about. I love it. I love when we get disclaimers. We say, we have, here are yeah. seven things, yeah. but then again, what, what, what the heck do we know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, have a great day. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.